Among the many problems I have with religious faith, the one that I want to concentrate on in this video is the way that I see faith being used to excuse what I'm calling intellectual defeatism. What do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. I think the easiest way to explain what I mean by intellectual defeatism is to give an example. And the example I'm going to give that really sums it up is Bill O'Reilly, who in 2007 said, I think it takes more faith to be like you, an atheist, than like me, a believer. And it's because of nature. You know, I just don't think we could have lucked out to have the tides come in, the tides go out, sun go up, sun go down. Don't think it could have happened. This mentality of thinking things are too complicated and therefore it must be God, or appealing basically to your own ignorance as evidence of God, is pretty much what I see as intellectual defeatism, and I see faith playing a massive role in that problem. And in this video, I want to look specifically at some Christian texts that I think are very harmful to people's ability to self-educate, to question, and be skeptical, because their faith encourages them not, not to. Before we start, let's get in some definitions here. In terms of what I mean by intellectual, I'm referring here to a specific idea, and I'm defining that as the rational rather than the emotional. And in terms of defeatism, what I mean by that is, and I'm quoting here from Wikipedia, which is an awesome source, as you all know, the acceptance of defeat without struggle, often with negative connotations. So by this combination of intellectual defeatism, what I'm really talking about is the Rather than engaging their intellects, believers claim something cannot be understood, and only God have, could have done it, even if there are scientific and philosophical answers available. I want to look more closely at the Christian texts for two reasons. One, because I'm an American, and it's Christianity that is promoting this sort of non-thinking in the U.S. that I want to specifically react to. And two, I'm a former Christian myself, and so I feel like I can speak from more experience um, having lived through this mentality and that way I don't have to deal with Judaism and Islam um, because I don't know those as well. So I'm limiting my critique here really to the faith of, of Christians, but I think we could probably find ways to apply this outside of Christianity to other forms of monotheism and other forms of religion except perhaps maybe Buddhism, although there is a little bit of um, accepting the supernatural as a, pre you know, as a foundational premise for the belief system. I want to look at three specific passages in this video. We're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians 4.18, 2 Corinthians a line um, from 5.7, and finally Hebrews 11.1. 1. So let's get going. Before we start the discussion on these specific passages, I now want to introduce a definition of faith that I will be using as my anchor as I look through all of these passages. So here I'm defining faith as, again from Wikipedia, a belief, confidence, or trust in a person, object, religion, idea, or view, despite the absence of proof. So that's the definition I'm going to be working with for this video. In the next few minutes, what I'd like to show is how the elevation of faith over a healthy skepticism leads to self-delusion. If I assert with deep faith that I can fly, despite all the evidence to the contrary, then I'm being delusional. And I think if you assert that Jesus was a god, despite all rational arguments to the opposite, that is also a form of being delusional. And I think faith underpins this, and it allows for people to give justifications for their positions, which really do not have good basis either in reality or in rational arguments. Before I start critiquing these Bible passages, I do want to stipulate that ancient people did have a completely different worldview from us. They did not have science, they did not have the kinds of access to technology and information that we have today. Fair enough. But their ignorance does not provide a cover for modern-day people to basically go back to uh, an ancient worldview as if it was still valid. I think it's up to modern people to critique these ideas just as much as they would critique any other idea today. And you can't justify a biblical passage as being valid just because it was written and it's down in the Bible. If it's the idea of people who are pre-scientific and ignorant, then they should be questioned. So when we approach these texts not with a reverence that they are the Word of God and therefore should be accepted on because they are in a certain book, the ideas really start to show themselves for being the poor forms of thinking that they really are. So citing from 2 Corinthians 4.18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things that are not seen, 
For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Okay, you can't look at things that are unseen, <laughs> right? It says, you know, um, we look while well, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Well, how do you see something that's not seen? Again, it sounds pretty and you know, overt, but when you start to unpack it, you just go, no, no, that doesn't make sense. There's also another crazy assertion, that the things which are not seen are eternal. Well, again, what a load of toss. If I can't see something, how do I know whether or not it's eternal? The idea that just because you can imagine something and you can imagine it to being, uh, being unseen does not necessarily mean it pops into existence just because you imagine it. And also attributing a, a characteristics like eternal to something that you can't see, how could you possibly know? Again, the phrasing might sound really pretty, but when you start to actually question it on a packet, you realize it's a load of crap. So what we see here are a series of assertions not based on evidence, but by MSUing. And by MSU, I mean make shit up. In other words, Paul here wants there to be an eternal, and he also knows that he can't see it, so he conflates these two things. That which I can't see must be eternal, because I have an idea of God which is eternal, and I don't see any evidence of God. So the fact that I can't see God means that somehow he exists, and I can see him but not see him, and by not seeing him know he's eternal. Again, it all just starts to fall apart when you really start to try to put it together. The next bit we're going to look at is the phrase, we walk by faith, not by sight. And I think this really encourages believers to reject evidence that they find in the world that might contradict their worldview. Now a perfect example of this walking not by um, sight but by faith is William Lane Craig. And he is sort of exemplifies the self-delusion of reinforcing your own belief systems internally by their own validation, claiming that because you have faith in, you, in them, that somehow they're valid. So I'd like to quote William Lane Craig here, where he says, The way we know Christianity to be true is by the self-authenticating witness of God's Holy Spirit. Now what do I mean by that? I mean that the experience of the Holy Spirit is unmistakable for him who has it that arguments and evidence incompatible with that truth are overwhelmed by the experience of the Holy Spirit. So basically he's saying it doesn't matter what evidence you put out there for me, I'm going to reinforce my own self-delusion that my worldview is right despite anything that you put up in front of me. Now obviously this is an incredibly dangerous way to think about the world because the world doesn't change for, to fit our, our views. We have to conform our views to match reality. And by claiming that somehow you can self-authenticate knowledge by just saying, oh, I really feel it and I really have it in me, anyone can make any crap up and self-authenticate it. And if we treated medicine like that, if we treated, say, dealing with NASA and sending things to the moon or into outer space like that, nothing would work. And yet somehow we're supposed to expect that religion has this privilege that always fails us in every other aspect of life that requires verification. It just shows how faith really encourages intellectual defeatism and for it encourages people not to go outside and look for new information, but rather to their default position to be to deny anything that could possibly contradict what they've already decided to be true. The last passage I want to bring up in terms of evidence that faith can basically encourage intellectual defeatism and perpetuation of ignorance, is the line from Hebrews. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. To be honest, the first half of that I would agree with. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You're hoping for them because you don't know whether they're, they're true or not. The second line though is nonsense. The idea that faith is the evidence of things not seen. No, it's not. The evidence of things not seen is not evidence, it's speculation at most. And the idea that you can have evidence of things not seen, I think is best summarized by that quip from Tim Minchin in his show, when a believer said to him, aha, well if you need evidence you don't have evidence for love, do you? And Tim's reply is, well yes, sure I have evidence for love. Love without evidence is stalking. The next line reads, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Ontologically, I have to object to the idea that faith is the reality of what is hoped for. That doesn't even make sense. Faith is not the basis of an external reality, nor is it an appropriate a basis for my internal perception of reality. If faith could produce 
the reality of what I hope for, then I would never age and I would never rise above, above a size 10. So clearly when we actually try to apply this to anything outside of religious woo-woo nonsense and claims about God, it immediately falls down. The idea that faith is the proof of what is not seen, again, the author of Hebrews, who by the way was not Paul, um, Hebrews is an anonymous document, we don't know who wrote it, this person is maybe a poet, but he was not a rigorous thinker. Things that you can't observe cannot serve as proof for anything. So scientists, by observation and inferring things and theorizing, came up with the idea that Higgs bosons must exist. But the fact that they had faith in the idea that their predictions would turn out to be right doesn't mean that we didn't have to go looking for Higgs bosons. Of course we do. And so the idea that faith can be proof of what is not seen is just refuted, again, by our everyday modern lives. It might have sounded good in the ancient world, but in the 21st century, this doesn't hold up. So just to be clear, I don't think it's fair to judge people um, in the ancient world by modern standards. And I really don't. But in terms of our modern understanding of epistemology, there's really no excuse for modern people to wallow in or even praise this kind of ignorance as desirable. Finally, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. All right, so faith and assurance are opposites and incompatible. If you have been assured in something, about something, then you can no longer have faith in it because now you have an assurance, you have something concrete upon which to rest your ideas. And again, this idea that you can have conviction in things that are unseen encourages self-delusion. It robs the holder of, of that they have any responsibility to verify or validate the claims that their religion is making. This mentality also does no favor for believers because eventually they're going to come into contact with skeptics. And you know, just because some Christians believe that Jesus physically flew up into the sky and disappeared, the fact that they have that deeply held belief is not rational evidence in favor of that event happening. And therefore it's not a compelling reason for me to accept that belief. As we all know, Christopher Hitchens said, that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. And religion brainwashes people into thinking that these ridiculous claims are not ridiculous because they, if they really, really believe them, um, then that somehow makes them true. And when they're confronted with skeptics who point out the deficiencies in their thinking, instead of being open to the evidence and willing to question it and look into it, and they tend to attack instead of us, right? They um, don't see the possibility that their ideas are ridiculous. Rather, they tend to turn on us and call us names or say that we're in league with the devil or that we are demons just for asking hard questions. It was Bertrand Russell who said, as far as I can remember, there is not one word in the gospels in praise of intelligence. And faith, as we have seen, is an excuse to accept whatever is fed to you without any critical thought. This also provides a textual reference for theists and believers who want to refuse to self-educate on issues of science and philosophy, to reject evidence out of hand as somehow the lies of Satan, to do the mental equivalent of sticking their fingers in their ear when they're presented with counterfactuals that disturb their predetermined worldviews. And it also encourages them to accuse opponents of being demons or in league with Satan in order to dehumanize us so that they can don't have to deal with the ideas, they can just say that we're mean and terrible, awful people and try to walk away. Christians will often point to the fact that over the course of European history, it was at Christian universities that a lot of these scientific discoveries were made. And that's true, but only up until the time when science started to really diverge away from the church's doctrine, and in particular when it started to undermine religious claims about the role of the earth and human beings in the universe. The obvious and most famous conflict of this was when Galileo uh, and the Roman Catholic Church fell out because of his observations of the movements within the solar system. And for this, Galileo was tried by the Inquisition, condemned as a heretic, and spent the rest of his life in house arrest. So we see that religion tends to attack science in very particular areas. And it attacks science, not in chemistry or not in botany, but it goes after those uh, elements of science where it 
takes away from the notion that human beings are special in nature and in the universe. Galileo was attacked because he suggested that humans were not the physical center of the universe. And while that sounds crazy to us now, that um, idea of what the place of the world was in terms of the celestial bodies and God's purpose was central to the way people thought about themselves at that time. Evolution was attacked because it undermined the idea that humans were separate from other creatures in nature and that somehow humans were uniquely the product of a special creation of God that gave us a soul and therefore we are not really animals, we are something above animals. And we also see abiogenesis being attacked by fundamentalists because it removes the supernatural from the idea of the start of life. When it sees uh, life is the chemical processes moving from organic to um, inorganic to organic. This again removes the role of God and the idea that somehow life is special and unique in the universe and could have only come from a supernatural being. So where religion attacks science never really has, it only attacks science in those areas that are relevant to the religion's ideas of humans being special and anything that removes that in terms of whether it's our location in the universe, what kind, whether or not we're apes, or whether or not life is unique. Those are the areas that they choose to attack. So what can we do about this? To be honest, it's easier to identify the problem than it is to propose a solution. But one way that I think we could deal with this when we see it on debate boards and you know in other places in our life is to point out that Really, religion demands to be treated in a completely separate way from any other human idea, and that this is random and unjustified. I think when all else fails, quote Douglas Adams. And so I'm going to quote this bit at length. I'll probably put up the slide so you can follow along. In the case of an idea, if we think, here's an idea that is protected by holiness or sanctity, what does it mean? Why should it be that it's perfectly legitimate to support the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, Republicans or Democrats, this model of economics versus that, Macintosh instead of Windows, but to have an opinion about how the universe began, about who created the universe? No, that's holy? What does that mean? Why do we ring fence that for any other reason other than that we've just got used to doing so? There's no other reason at all. It's just one of those things that crept into being, and once that loop gets going, it's very, very powerful. So we are not used to challenging religious ideas, but it's very interesting how much of a furore Richard creates when he does it. Everybody gets absolutely frantic about it because you're not allowed to say these things. Yet when you look at it rationally, there is no reason why those ideas shouldn't be as open to debate as any other, except that we have agreed somehow between us that they shouldn't be. Well, the difference between, I guess, when Douglas said that and now is that more and more people are saying that they should be, that they should be questioned. And so I hope that in this video, I've given you something to think about in terms of the role of faith and this intellectual defeatism, that you might be a bit more sensitized to it when you see it on debate boards or in other places, and to maybe open up a question and a dialogue with people you know about whether or not religion really should receive the kind of special privilege that it has currently, or whether, as with any other human idea, it should be open up to criticism, critique, and ridicule. So, I've been Christy, you've been awesome, and I hope to see you again on my channel later on. Bye.